Hey everybody, let's get started. This will be lesson three. I really am fascinated with the Gilded Age. Um, it's the time period that is, I don't know, I wouldn't consider really very modern. You know, and maybe sometimes we call this the Industrial Revolution, but we're going to focus on different aspects of it. But you definitely, you don't need to memorize these years, but you need to be able to describe them. And that's what this slide is about right here. What is the Gilded Age? So write this down. So write the question on one side of your note card, flip it over and write everything else. So what do we mean by gilded? Well, gilded, I want you to think of the word like bedazzled. Okay, think of like a really obnoxious cell phone protector case. You know, it's like all pink and sparkly. Well, it's shiny on the outside, <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that your phone is any good. It just means you've got a shiny case. I want you to think of it as like a donkey turd. Okay, you know, it's really shiny on the outside, but if you dig in, what do you get? You know, you get more turd, okay? The reason the Gilded Age is called the Gilded Age is because it looked really good from a distance. Why did it look good? Because there was some wealth. Not everybody had it, but there was some wealth. People had jobs. They weren't great jobs, but they had jobs. There were jobs for Anybody who wanted the business. It was a time of laissez-faire. Now, laissez-faire, and we'll put this on a separate note card, but it means, look at me, hands off, hands off. So laissez-faire government means the government is just going to back off and let, let the big industrial corporations do whatever they want to. You know, you want to set the river on fire, go for it. You want to pollute the air with all that rust, go for it. We don't care. We're just the government. You do whatever you want. And so the Gilded Age is basically the late 1800s. Okay? So make sure you have that written down. This is important. Okay. Now, to describe the Gilded Age, I want you to understand that this was a time not everybody was wealthy, but a very small top percentage of people are wealthy, like the top 1%. And these people were just stinking rich, golden toilets, <clears throat> $15,000 dog collars, lakes inside restaurants. And the ladies, they, they would put these stuffed birds on their hat. And that was a big fashion of the time. They would put, they would like kill these birds and they would put them on ladies' hats and almost drove some species to extinction. And it, it was ridiculous, you know, like using a hundred dollar bill to light a cigar. I mean, that, was a, that was a lot of money back then, still a lot of money. But this is, and some people say that today in 2020, we're having a new Gilded Age because we have few rich people and a lot of poor people. Some people say that we are living the Gilded Age again. Okay, you do not need to write this down. Um, you might. And it might run your own business. Okay, and some people did that in America. A lot of people did that in America, you know, like you start your own business. Some people became billionaires, trillionaires and millionaires and stuff. But that's what entrepreneurship is. Okay, is starting your own business. So you're not working for somebody, you are working for yourself. Okay. All right, hit pause if you want to, but I'm moving on. Okay, who are the robber barons? <clears throat> I don't know how, <clears throat> I'm not sure how important it is to have these memorized. I definitely want you to know about Andrew Carnegie. Rockefeller, he was very important, and I talk about him a lot. Um, and, and maybe it's worth writing down. I mean, I certainly do talk about him a lot, so maybe you could at least be familiar with Rockefeller and Carnegie. 
But these guys are some of the richest guys in America uh, during the Gilded Age. Carnegie is the most important for this class. There was a saying back in the day that, oh boy, he's rich as Rockefeller. Rockefeller was the richest man in the world. How did he get rich? Oil, okay? And Carnegie, <clears throat> he got rich by giving people a product that, that they needed, but was very expensive until he learned how to make it cheap. And his name is Andrew Carnegie. I keep wanting to say Carnegie, but it's really Carnegie. Vanderbilt was known for the railroads, a major industry of the time. And JP Morgan, he was a banker. He was so rich that that he personally bailed out the United States government. <clears throat> I'm not sick, I just say things. So robber barons, that's not a very nice term. Uh, you could say these guys are just capitalists and these are good guys that made our country better. And some teachers have that debate. Other teachers at Sunset have this debate with their students. Are these bad guys or are they good guys? I don't know. Okay, the answer is both. <clears throat> okay, we need to take a look at some cartoons, and I hope you enjoy this, but we need to take a look at some cartoons, and I may have you answer some questions on Edpuzzle about them. You need to be able to look at a cartoon and analyze it. Okay, I believe that this is Andrew Carnegie, one of the richest men in the world. Now, I want you to take a look at what he is standing over. What do you think that is? What is he standing over? And so that is the Capitol building. That's where they make the laws in Washington, D.C., the Congress. And so what this is symbolic of is that he is above the law meaning that Carnegie felt like he could just do whatever he wanted to. And look at Uncle Sam and Lady Liberty going, WTF, you know, what's up? Come on, Carnegie, come on, play along. Play along. This is an important cartoon. So whenever you see a cartoon, always look for the words. What is, what is this person standing on? What does it say? It says, standard guy is, who is the oil guy? The oil guy is Rockefeller, okay? So Rockefeller was the oil guy. But now take a look at his crown. Look at, look at what's in his crown, the trains. So you might be thinking, wait a minute, Rockefeller's the oil guy. What does he have to do with trains? Well, what Rockefeller did was he went to the trains and he said, hey guys, I tell you what, I'll fill your trains with oil. I'll be a good customer to you, but you trains only ship my oil. Do not ship anyone else's oil. And if you ship anybody else's oil, then I will take away my oil and I will, you know, and so Rockefeller, that's how Rockefeller got so rich. He created a trust with the trains. So the trains wouldn't ship any oil other than standard oil. So the other oil companies went out of business. They went bankrupt. So before you know it, and uh, Rockefeller owned all of the oil, like 95% of the oil in the country. And that's how he became the richest man that probably ever what lived in America. Okay. Now this is a very common cartoon. So look for any words, look for any buildings. So you've got an octopus, but look for the word above the octopus's face. 
What does that say on top? It says stand. Standard oil is picking on standard oil. So is it saying something nice about Rockefeller or is it saying that Rockefeller is mean? Okay. So what is this octopus reaching for? What's that on the left? These are government buildings. That's the White House. That's the Capitol building on the left. Okay. And I'm not sure who they are, but the point is, is that the oil industry, standard oil is taking over everything. That's the point of this cartoon is standard oil is taking over everything. Okay, so here's another one. So who are we talking about here? Look at the collar. Okay, now what is Rockefeller known for? Well, you may have it memorized, but if you don't, look, this is, a, this is a, look at all that black. Look at the black barrels. That's oil. And there is a caption at the bottom of this cartoon that I should have put. Here is the caption. Here it goes. He's looking at the White House and Rockefeller is, is saying, what a funny little government. What a funny little government. So the point is, is that Rockefeller is too powerful. So here's another cartoon. You've got Monopoly. You got Monopoly pick the normal the normal guy. <clears throat> the donkey says poverty. Okay? And it says here, the tournament of today, a set to between labor, labor and a monopoly. Okay, so what is a monopoly? A monopoly is when one company controls everything. Okay. Now here's another one. This guy, his name is Pullman. And I remember Pullman because there was this factory that had stripes labor union problems. And the employee is being squeezed between high rent and low wages. <clears throat> and so that's why there was a strike. I mean, the, the workers refused to work and it was a really bad strike there. All right, so a little bit more about Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie. Now take a guess, you football fans are gonna know where Carnegie started. The answer is Pittsburgh. And for you football fans, Pittsburgh Steelers, because that's where Carnegie's first steel mill was. So Carnegie, um, steel used to be very expensive, but Carnegie found a way to make it cheap and to mass produce it. And he did not invent the Bessemer process, but he took took it and he made it on us down. What is the Bessemer process? And it was a way to mass produce steel to make it affordable. And so if you were to go into a steel mill, you would see a, some of these. The Bessemer process is about taking super hot air and shooting it through molten lava, okay? Basically it purifies it, it makes it cheaper, and it makes it better. So before Andrew Carnegie, we didn't have a lot of steel. I mean, we had a little bit, but not a lot. 
not a lot at all. Okay. So this is a lot about Andrew Carnegie. I don't think you want to write all this down, but on the left, it shows a lot of good stuff that Carnegie did. He made steel cheap and available, and that's a big deal. He gave lots of jobs to lots of people. That's a good thing. He, and he donated millions of dollars to libraries and trade schools and things like that. I mean, so he wasn't all bad. I mean, he was a good guy. Unfortunately, his workers were paid very low wages. Carnegie's steel mills polluted the air and the water. And a lot of his workers went on strike. And these strikes were violent. And uh, Carnegie, it's funny how he would donate millions to libraries, but he wouldn't give his workers a raise. Even though he was the second richest man in the world, it was ridiculous. Okay, and here's Rockefeller again. I'm not having you write this down. I'll tell you what to write down. But Rockefeller, oil, he was the richest man in the world. And honestly, he just gave people what they wanted. Kerosene for lights at metal for cars and gasoline for automobiles in the 20s. I mean, he just gave people what they wanted. Now here's a picture of, of, Vander, of, of, of Vanderbilt's mansion. I just really wanted you to see this picture. I, I like to look at colorized photographs and, and I just wanted you to see it. Okay. So, and here's another picture I thought was really cool. Um, New York City, people going to Coney Island or something like that. I just thought it was a really cool picture. Okay, write this down. What is a monopoly? Hit pause if you need to. Just write down the red. Okay, hit pause if you need to, but I'm gonna start talking. Think about the word mono. Mono means one. Okay, think about like monotheistic religion or the word monogamy, okay? And then look at the word poly. Poly means many, like a polygon or a polytheistic religion. So if you look at the word monopoly, it means one over many. So one company owning an entire industry. So, so for a while, Standard Oil was a monopoly. I do want you to know what a trust is. It's the same thing, railroads and oil. A good way of explaining a trust is like you're playing the game Monopoly and you team up with someone else and say, okay, I won't pay, I won't charge you rent if you don't charge me rent. And you work with somebody else and to win the game. Okay, that's basically what a trust is. It's basically like a monopoly. Okay, now just for discussion, is Google a monopoly? I would say no because who is Google's competitor? Bing, okay? What about Microsoft? Are they a monopoly? Well, they came close, but they do have competitors. Apple is a competitor, even though Google owns Apple <laughs> for the most part. Now here's a good one, your internet. Whatever internet company you have, is that a monopoly? Do you have a choice? If you don't, then it's, they act like a monopoly or your cable company. If they have no competitors, then, then it's like a monopoly. Okay. 
Okay, this is important and I need you to write this down. So think about what are what is good about big business and what is bad about big business. Because the Gilded Age is about big business like Carnegie and Standard Oil, okay? Big businesses are more efficient, okay? Big businesses are more efficient, so they lead to lower prices. Okay, lower prices is about like um, uh, sodas. You know, you get Coca-Cola versus some homemade soda, it's gonna be cheaper. Another good thing about big business is that they provide jobs for people. Okay, that's good. So what about bad things about big business? Sometimes they have an unfair competitive advantage. Sometimes they exploit their workers, they pollute our environment, and they have too much government influence. Hit pause and write that down, this is important. So let me ask you this. This is, this is a big deal. I want you to really think about this. What is a good example? And I'm going to, what is a good example of a big business today? I mean, think about it. What is one of the biggest businesses today? Think about who the richest guy in the world is right now. Okay. Or think about where you like to shop. You know, what, what are some of the biggest businesses? Okay, and in that, in your mind, does that big business fit all of this on the screen? Okay, where do you buy your things from? And where do you get good, do they give you good prices? Probably. Do they provide jobs? Yes. Are they good jobs? Maybe not. Okay. All right, moving right along. All right. Make sure you know what this is, so write this down if you don't know it. Laissez-faire, laissez-faire. Hit pause and write this down if you need to. So when you think of laissez-faire, I want you to think lazy off. So let me ask you this, do you want a laissez-faire government? Do you want a government that just leaves you alone and lets you do whatever you want? Well, it sounds good, doesn't it? It's like, yeah, legalize it, you know, and let me do what I want and, and don't make me pay taxes. You know, sounds good, doesn't it? But let me ask you this. The next time you go to Wendy's and you take a bite into that burger, don't you want to be sure that you're eating cow and not dog or rat or something? You know, with all the government health inspectors, you want some government, okay? So laissez-faire government may not be the best way to do it. Some people think it is, but not me. I want a little bit of government, okay? All right, so take a look at this question. I don't think this is a particularly easy question, but this, I got this off the EOC. Take a look at it. So you've got like a magazine cover. This cover from a 19th century periodical, that's a magazine, helps illustrate that the United States is beginning to change from what? Okay, hit pause. Okay, the answer is a. Okay. All right, moving right along. During the Gilded Age, there was a notable increase in federal support for what? Okay, so you got to think big picture. What is the Gilded Age? And you're going to need to be able to describe different time periods. Okay, the answer is A, big business. Wow. 
which term refers to a time in which greed and corruption ran rampant while displays of respectability, generosity, and reform provided a distracting overlay or a gilded veneer to that decadence. Decadence is like excess, like too much. The answer is, After using the Bessemer process to accumulate great wealth in steel production, Carnegie built many public libraries and contributed to many universities such as Tuskegee Institute. Because of this actions, he is remembered as a, the answer is philanthropist, but no, no, this is wrong. I'm sorry. Um, never mind. Forget this. Moving right along. Okay. Guys, the conditions of labor was really bad. People worked very long, 10 to 14 hours a day, six days a week. It was bad. Wages were horrible and women and children were paid less. Conditions were dangerous. It was dirty. It was dangerous. It was all of that. Okay. And, and so, yeah, it was a tough time. The Gilded Age was a tough time. Okay. Um, it's really hard to compare um, wage. Just from today, but you know, times were tough. Just remember that times were tough. So again, um, as the factory owners grew richer, the conditions for the new working class worsened dramatically. Early factories were appalling, unsafe places to work with no safeguards for workers. Jobs were repetitive, boring, and monotonous. Mono, mono, one, monotonous. So it means you're doing the same thing over and over again. Okay, so yeah, it was bad. Okay, very dangerous, very bad. Children worked a lot. There was no elementary school, so you might as well send the kids to work. A lot of kids worked at home. Some kids worked in the factories. Sometimes it was dangerous. These young men will die by the time they hit 20 years old because they breathe in so much coal dust. Okay, I need you to write this down. This isn't easy to explain, but I need you to write this down. This is important. Hit pause and write this down. Okay. Political machines, I want you to think of them as like mobsters. Imagine this, you get off the boat, you arrive in New York City, you're an immigrant, and somebody comes up to you wearing a nice suit and tie and it's like, hey, welcome to America. You got a job? And you're like, no, I don't have a job. Well, I'll get you a job. Do you have a place to stay? No, I don't have anything. Okay. Okay, let me get you a plate, do all this stuff for you. And then eventually these political machines are gonna want something from you. Um, like, okay, you know, so they'll come back, you know, and, uh, and they'll, they'll get people to vote for them. You know, it's like, and why not, you know? And back then, everybody knew who you voted for. It was public record. So you receive help from these political machines and you better vote for these machines to stay in power. So are these political machines corrupt? Oh yeah, heck yeah, they're corrupt. But were they helpful? Yes, they were helpful. They helped immigrants settle into a new country. So they were helpful, but they were also corrupt. So look at this guy. He looks kind of mean, right? In the cartoon, it says the ballot. 
that means the vote. In counting, there is strength. And so basically, these guys are like mobsters. Not exactly, but pretty close. And they would do things that really isn't, isn't all that common. Like, for example, if your building burned down and you didn't vote for the boss, the fireman would show up and just let it burn. Hey, the boss says to let it burn because they didn't vote for the boss. The opposite is true. Hey, this neighborhood over here, they voted for me, so let's get that, let's get them that sewer. Let's get them the streets. You know, let's get them the plumbing. You know, they, they need a bridge. So let's get this neighborhood a bridge because they vote. Voted for me. So if you don't know what this word means, go ahead and write it down. Infrastructure, streets, bridges, plumbing. So the political machines would help infrastructure to neighborhoods who voted for them. But if you didn't vote for them, then they would withhold infrastructure. Okay. So I just wanted to show you some pictures of child labor. I've already shown you some. Okay. These girls are in New Orleans and they were shucking oysters. And here's some kids working in a dirty factory. That's a more clean factory right there. Okay. That looks more like 1940s to me. Now look at these kids. Notice they're barefoot. They don't have any shoes, but they have to climb up there to, to do, deal with the machine. There's another barefoot girl working in a textile factory. You see all the spools of thread? More coal miners. Okay, not an easy question, but let's do it. What was one reason for the expansion of machine politics? in the late 19th century. So first of all, you need to know when was the 19th century. The 19th century was the 1800s. Eight. All right, not an easy question because there's a word that a lot of you don't know and the, answer, the word is influx. Influx means a whole lot are coming along at once. Like for example, um, there was an influx of kids going to the counseling office to get their schedule changes. That's what influx means. It means a whole lot at once. Okay, so what this question is saying is that since so many immigrants are coming to this country, that the political machines were helpful. Okay. During the 19th century, one way political bosses gained voter support was by what? Okay, remember what I said, 19th century, that's the 1800s. Okay, had nothing to do with women's suffrage, had nothing to do with poll taxes, had nothing to do with slaves. The answer is, C, making improvements in urban infrastructure. So streets, sewers, bridges. Which of the following best characterizes the Gilded Age? Okay, so this is a time period question. And I'm gonna teach you more time periods, okay? But you need to know what is the Gilded Age? Which one of these describes the Gilded Age? The answer is B.
All right, that's enough.